Hello, everyone out there. It's your host for the Sales Dev Squad podcast, Mateo Elvira. Have a very special training and discussion for you guys today. Uh, we have a really great host, or excuse me, really great guest today. Um, he's uh, provided tremendous support to the Sales Dev Squad p podcast from the beginning. Um, big shout out to Patrick Joyce, who is currently the uh, Director of Business Development over at Fullcast. Uh, Patrick, thanks for joining us today. Mateo, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited uh, for my, my worldwide podcast debut here. <laughs> We're happy to have you, Patrick. Um, yeah, so Patrick has an interesting background in sales development. Today, we'll just be learning a little bit more about you know, what he's currently doing to help scale and, and kind of grow um, the SDR team over at Fullcast, a little bit more about his previous background in sales development over at ZipWhip. And we will also be doing a live cold email training for you guys. So a lot of great stuff for you guys. And let's go ahead and hop in. Um, Patrick, really just kind of want to start off. Um, I'm looking at your LinkedIn background right now. Obviously, you have a background in mathematics. You were a math and computer science teacher, did a little bit of marketing work. And then you kind of hopped into like insurance and like sales development. Um, would love to just kind of hear like how you got into sales development. Um, and yeah, just would love to just kind of hear how you fall, fell into it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely a little bit more of a roundabout path than a lot of people take. Um, I started out as a, a teacher in Boston for about four years. Um, and I got into teaching because I was like, I really liked math in college. Um, I had started out as a computer science major and like CS just like wasn't it for me. Like programming wasn't my thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I had taken a lot of math classes and I really liked math and I didn't need that much more to get a major. So and it, like it was something I was really good at. I liked explaining it. Um, so like that told me like maybe I should just teach math because if I'm good at explaining math like that, it seems like a valuable skill. So I went out and I did it for a while and it, again, like just wasn't for me. Like uh, there's a lot of things about teaching that I really liked and there's a lot of things that are really, really hard and I respect the profession like an incredible amount. Like those people are very highly skilled. I'm surprised that there's not more teachers in sales um, just because of like a lot of the, like presenting material over and over again, um, finding a way to engage your audience, uh, you know, sort of being able to like read the room and decide whether or not you're actually making a connection with them mm -hmm. um, and, and having to evaluate whether or not the people that you're, that you're talking with are, are understanding the message the way that you're trying to convey it. Like while you're actually in a sale, those are like super important skills. Absolutely. Um, so, so the, the transition to sales there was, was sort of roundabout. Like once I left teaching, I decided like teaching wasn't for me. I wanted to, you know, use my math background and sort of, um, my analytical ability. So, uh, I don't know if you know what actuaries do, um, but actuaries work for insurance companies. They basically do like really fancy statistics to come mm -hmm. up with uh, insurance rates and they calculate like, you know, the probability or, you know, they assess um, like a present value on future risk. This okay. is sort of the uh, one cool. way to explain it. Um, so there's like some exams you can take to, to become an actuary. And I, I started doing that. Um, I got one of the exams done and I started working for an insurance company as a marketing analyst, as you mentioned there. Um, and there was like a lot of, uh, industry stuff that I had to learn. Um, but what I found out while I was, while I was working there, like while I was in the office, like the people that I was talking to that I really wanted to hang out with and like, I wanted to do their job were the salespeople, like <laughs> the brokers, the guys that were hanging out, they had the big offices. It seemed like they were just having fun all day. They were talking to people. And I was like, I want to do that. Like, how do I get into that? I didn't even know that that was a thing. Um, I didn't know that that's was something that I wanted to do. So I just started asking, like, how did you guys get where you are? Um, and there's, there's this one particular guy that sat me down and said, you know, you, you're a personable dude. If you don't mind getting on the phone and doing cold calls and stuff like you could make like five times your salary, whatever you're doing now. Um, you, you know, this, this is what I did. He said, I got on the phones. I was selling insurance. Um, it's really hard to sell insurance. You, Absolutely. Like you have to be able to do cold calls and like be okay with that. Um, and sort of pound the phones and figure it out. And like, you'll find your way, like just, just start doing that. So while I was working there, I started selling life insurance. Um, you know, it's not that hard to find, 
uh, you know, a mentor or somebody that will, will help you get started with that. Um, and I just started, you know, with like really old mortgage leads, like, uh, people that had bought a house five years ago and had filled out a form saying that they wanted to buy life insurance. Like those are the people, those are the leads I was calling. <laughs> like it, it was tough. Um, I, I got a few appointments. I, I wrote a few policies, uh, and that told me like, I, I can hack it. I like, I can get on the phone and do this stuff. Um, and like, honestly, as I was just like hanging out on Reddit, um, looking at, you know, r slash sales, like our sales, like everybody on there talks about trying to get into the tech industry, you know, like that, um, some of their friends that had gone to school to become lawyers and stuff, like they spent eight years in college and it's like, well, yeah, I got an, an SDR job and a year and a half later I was a sales manager and this is my salary and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like making a ton of money and my friend is still in school and has student loans to pay. So I'm like, okay, tech sales is it. <laughs> I can get on the phone and do this stuff. Uh, um, let me, let me try to get an SDR job. So I had done like a few different insurance gigs um, and taking the, the, the first SDR job was like a, a big step back for me because like I had graduated from school and and like started a career and worked for four years and like built up to a certain level. Um, and, you know, as a teacher, like you get a lot of respect, like people trust you with things like you're in charge of a lot of things. Like you're basically like you're a classroom manager, like you're you're just making all the decisions of how things go. And as an SDR, you are the exact opposite. You're the lowest person on in the org, really. Like you yeah. are taking orders from everybody. Um, and and really like just struggling to to stay keep your head above water and to stay alive. So I went in there um with the mindset that like I really need to make a name for myself. Like I really need to like I wanted to be prepared. I so I did a ton of reading before I got the job. Um I I wanted to make this point. I wanted to make sure that I, I made the point of like the stuff that I read to get where I am, like that got me really good. Uh, number one, Zig Ziglar, Secrets of Closing the Sale or Secrets of Closing the Deal, whatever that book is called. Like, please, please, if you're an SDR, like 100% go out there and get that audio book, like pay $15.99 on audible.com, download the audio book and listen to it more than one time. Um, a lot of the stuff that like Zig Ziglar is like this classic Texas gentleman and he's got like, like you, that's why you get to hear the audio book. Cause you get to hear this <laughs> back. like just yeah the way that his inflection, like the way that he speaks um, it's like very classic themes and sales. Like as you, as I read more and more literature that comes out, it's really just circling back to the same kind of stuff that he was saying. Mm -hmm. So to me, like Zig Ziglar, he's the OG, like that's, that's the dude. Um, so like, you know, reading, like just doing reading on sales. And then there was a few books, um, outbound sales, no fluff. Um, that, that, one, one, yeah. that one was really good. Uh, just cause it's like really succinct. It gets to the point and it's like stuff that, that matters that like, um, you, you just, is it like a really good frame for your behavior? Um, so I got, I got the SDR job and pretty much like started setting meetings right away because I, I had gotten really good on the phones, um, selling life insurance and selling employee benefits insurance. Uh, and how long and, were you doing like uh, insurance sales before you kind of transitioned to tech sales? Yeah, it was like a solid, it, the, all the windows of time, like really overlapped, but there was like a solid six months of me doing cold calls from my bedroom before I took the SDR job. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but, and then like in those six months, like some, it, there was a few different jobs there that overlapped and, and whatever, but I was making a ton of, of phone calls every day from my house. Um, like with a dialer, with Google voice, like whatever, like sitting here, just like I am with you. Um, so, uh, you know, after, after all those cold calls, like once I got to zip whip, it was like, you know, selling software was like very easy in comparison. Yeah. You know, like I felt like all of a sudden, like these people were like, it, it, it just, it just, there was a fit for what I was doing. Like the person answering the phone was open to the idea of purchasing software. Like it was just, it, I, I don't want to say easy mode cause it wasn't easy, but it was like definitely much easier than what I was used to. Um, so like I had, uh, used like a lot of that success to, to con like, I, I doubled down on what I was good at. Um, that's, you know, one of my managers, Tyler there, like he, he really helped He like sat down with me. It was like, we listened to all my calls all the time. It was like, this is what you're really good at. Like, let's focus on that. And like, let's make sure we do that every time. Um, mm -hmm. 
So like I, I had like really strong phone skills when I got there, like just handling a conversation. Um, so that, that definitely gave me a leg up, I would say. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and then, yeah. So tell us a little bit more about, um, I guess the new role that you're in now and I guess the transition between zip whip, um, into where you're at now at Fullcast. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I really had no intention of leaving zip whip. Like I thought it, when I signed on there, I thought like minimum one year, like good, bad or indifferent. Like I just want to stay for a year and see what happens. Yeah. Um, and inside that year, like I had a lot of success, you know, I was, I was doing a really good job and I kind of like, I didn't have the option on LinkedIn turned on to, you know, I, I said, I'm not looking for a job. Like I do not let recruiters know, like I'm not, I'm not looking. <laughs> But somebody messaged me anyway, a recruiter messaged me anyway and said that they had an opportunity and they thought my profile fit. And like, I kind of just asked them why, cause I'm, I'm, I'm always skeptical. Like, you know, like how personal I, like how many people got that message and they, you know, they were looking for somebody that was a little bit older that, you know, had experience in sales dev, that it was a much smaller company that was looking to sort of get their sales development team off the ground. And that's like a lot of what I was trying to accomplish at ZipWhip was like being more involved in the strategy of like, you know, what are we doing? Like, what are we messaging? How are we messaging? You know, what personas are we going after? Like, how can we build a playbook? Um, like all the stuff that I was trying to accomplish there, like they were asking for somebody to come in and do that and build it from the ground up. And it was just like too good of an opportunity for me to not take a look at it. Um, and once I met the guys here, like it was just obvious that like they needed somebody to come in that was, you know, that, that wanted to be able to have control over what happened. Like somebody that didn't want to be fed, um, like, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's really easy as a sales rep, um, to say like, oh, it wasn't my fault because I didn't get the right leads or we didn't have the right. Uh, enablement tools or you know I didn't you know we I wasn't enabled in the right way and mm -hmm. they were like they pretty much set up this said, said to me straight up like we're not going to have the tools for you we don't have it figured out like we don't have a good cadence for you set up like we are asking you to come in and figure that out and I was like yeah let's let's do it so I mean it, it, that was a really exciting idea for me to like come in and see what I'm um, you know, sit, like really test myself and see if I can do it. And it's, it's, you know, we've been having some success. So it's, it, I'm in a good place. We're feeling good about it. Congratulations, by the way. I mean, uh, just even from making the jump from sales to tech sales to now building like an entire program from scratch, that that's really impressive. And like, congratulations, by the way, that that's really awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much. Of course. And I guess so we, to provide a little bit of context to our audience here, do you mind telling us a little bit about like what full cast is and, and what you guys kind of do over there? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this is something that we've been working on is like, what do you say to people when they ask you, like, what do you do? <laughs> and, and the short answer is really that we're, we're trying to streamline sales operations. Um, I, I think one of the best ways to like really describe where it came from and what it is um, is just like a, a little bit of a short story of like where it came from. So like in general, it's fullcast.io is a platform for sales planning. Um, and it was built by a bunch of CRM experts. So like these guys are like top notch sales force, um, like admins, like every. And, and their developers. So um, Bala is our CTO and he worked at Salesforce as their go-to-market planner. And, um, you know, in that role, he had to aggregate like uh, information from 4,500 sales reps because Salesforce is huge worldwide company. So when they're trying to decide what their go-to-market strategy is, like where, what territories are we going to go after and who's going to go after them and, um, you know, what market segments like are enterprise versus uh, mid market versus SMB? Like, how are we going to arrange that? Like, who's going to manage what teams? Like, that, like all of those plans get very, very complicated with that big of a company. Um, and anybody that has a Salesforce instance, like, has to think about those things when they're setting up their Salesforce account. Um, so, in Bala's case at Salesforce, there were 1,500 spreadsheets um, from 400 sales managers that all had input on their 
go to market plan for the year. So his planning exercise took eight months, which is just insane. Like that, I mean, it's most of the year that it would take to plan on what you're going to do for the next year Mm -hmm. um, because they would have to gather all the data, clean all the data, all this is done in spreadsheets. And then, you know, two, three months later, well, the gap, the the data that you gathered in the spreadsheet initially, like is out of date now. Um, So like that was his experience there. And then he sort of like, he developed a platform where you can do all of that go to market planning with live Salesforce data. You don't have to share spreadsheets anymore. It's a collaborative environment um, where you can update changes that affect change in Salesforce directly, like with custom apex code and using the Salesforce API. Um, so that's like uh, sort of a long winded version <laughs> of what we do. <laughs> no worries. That That's really awesome to hear. And I'm just kind of curious, like who is your guys' ideal like customer profile um, for, for that type of service? Yeah, um, there's like a, a few different types of companies that we could help. Like 100% though, our industry is like B2B SaaS companies. So like if, if it's for companies that are selling software that are growing fast. Um, if, if you're like a static company and you have 10 sales reps today and you're going to have 10 sales reps next year and you don't really plan on growing all that much, then like uh, you probably wouldn't have that much of a need for full cast because your Salesforce instance is static. Mm-hmm. You can set it up once and it'll pretty much work the way that you want it to for like for the rest of the time. But if you're going to go from like, z- you know, zero to five sales reps to 10 to 20 sales reps and now you have 30 sales reps and like sometimes that happens in the same year and you don't have like one person that's like a very skilled salesforce administrator like watching your salesforce instance the whole time like it's gonna get out of hand and you're gonna have all these like bad data issues that companies are running into uh you know like uh it's very hard to keep track of who are my prospects? Who are my, you know, what's my ideal customer profile? Like who's been contacted already? When were they contacted? Like, it, or what information do I need to capture? Um, do I have an SDR team? Uh, is my, are my account executives sourcing all of their own leads? Like all of those things make a difference in how you want to go, how you want to set up your Salesforce instance. And when your company grows really fast and you kind of don't have anybody, a lot of teams like, it takes them a while to add a sales ops team. Like, so, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to answer the question, basically like anybody that wants to grow really fast that has a Salesforce account that needs to be managed. Like that's who we want to talk to. That's great. So pretty much a fast growing SaaS company that just needs help to scale their Salesforce efforts as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like you want your sales execution to be tight and like there's like, two basic scenarios like you have a sales team it's going well it's going really well like you guys are crushing it you're hitting your number but there's no sales ops team that like the person that's in charge of of sales is also in charge of salesforce and then that is like a recipe for disaster because there's no way like the sales um uh priority is going to be prioritized like what it, the dealing with the customer dealing with the prospect like that's going to take priority and it should because that's the human interaction and like all that other stuff is you're just going to get pushed off and pushed off and the longer you push it off like the worse it's going to get so if you have a small sales team and you know you need somebody to come in and basically take over your salesforce account like we can do that we have a consulting service for that um if you have a big sales team like say you have a hundred sales reps and you know that there's bad data, you know that there's inefficiency in the way that the policies are set up. Like, you know, that there, there could be improvement in your execution on sales in Salesforce, like 100%, like we want to come in and structure the data, like clean it up, get it set up the way you want and install our package so that um, you can make all your territory adjustments and they'll push directly into clean data in your Salesforce account. So there's like, you know, the growing team that's like stretched too thin that doesn't have an ops team or there's like, you know, there's a hundred reps and we're growing fast and it's out of hand and I don't know how to fix it. Like those, you know, those are the, the, the types of companies that we're talking to. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. That's, that's some really exciting stuff there. And I feel like they definitely hired the, the right guy for the job there under BD. Um, so, I mean, I'm just kind of curious, Patrick, like, you know, where's the, the business development team right now? You know, where do you want it to be by the end of the year? And obviously it seems like you'll need like some, some really solid reps, you know, working hard to help kind of promote full cast, you know, what do you guys look for 
um, you know, and some SDRs. I'm just kind of curious, like what the roadmap looks for you guys and how you're going to get there. Yeah. Yeah. So like, um, the immediate plans is like, you know, uh, we have a small team. It's pretty tight. Like I'm running business development. Um, my buddy, Sean Fulmer, he's, he's basically our sales director. And then that's the sales team. <laughs> it's me and him. It's kind of like a one, two punch. And, and, you know, our VP of marketing is doing some work as well. You know, the CEO, like everybody at this stage of the startup, like it's such yeah. a tight team. It's like, everybody's kind of making a sales effort um, where we'd like to be by the end of the year. You know, I I'd like to, you hit some benchmarks in terms of, you know, revenue and, and like the number of customers that we want to acquire in that time. Uh, and then what we'd really like to do is like immediately start hiring a team, like, um, you know, one or two SDRs, but I, I don't even want to say SDR, like people say sometimes like the, the BDR label, like the, a business development representative, like represents a little bit more uh, than the traditional SDR role. Yeah. Where like in a traditional SDR role, like you're just calling and setting appointments and you don't even really have to know like what you're talking about. Or, I mean that it sounds bad to say that, but like you don't need to know much about the product or like, or be able to answer any technical questions because like you can just pivot that to, yep, that's a great question for my account executive. Like, you know, just two o'clock tomorrow work and then you've got your meeting and then you've got the person hooked. Um, but with, with like what we're doing here, it's like, it's such a new thing on the market. Um, there hasn't really been a platform that does what we're doing yet. It, it's it, like, we need people to be really, um, really invested and like really wrap their head around like what's happening and on sales ops teams uh, across the industry. So like we're looking for people that are interested in sales ops. Like if, if you're a Salesforce person, like you're really curious about how all that works and like you're dying to like learn more and find out more like that's, that's the type of person that we're looking for. That's awesome. Um, and I guess kind of going on that um, you've obviously had a lot of experience being an STR. You killed it as an STR. Have you noticed any, I guess, uh, reoccurring traits or similar traits that you notice amongst like, like really top performing SDRs or BDRs or, you know, the, the type of, uh, the type of people that just go above and beyond their job and crush it every month. I'm just kind of curious to hear like your thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, man. Um, there, there's some like really easy things like, um, I think people that do time blocking and time blocking is like a hot phrase, you know, but basically all it means is like people that can stay focused. Cause like, uh, the companies that we all work for are awesome. Startup companies are super fun places to work, man. Like there's a keg of kombucha and there's a long <laughs> table and there's music playing and there's like fun people to hang out with everywhere. But like, if you can put the blinders on and sit in front of your computer for two hours and get something done and like somebody walks up to your desk and you tell them you're busy like that, that is what, um, you know, top sales reps do the people that stay between four and 5 PM, like, and get there between six and 8 AM. Like those are the people that are doing well. Um, and it like, I'm not saying like get there at 6 AM and you have magic sales. I just mean like the, Make the most the, out of your time while you're there, the discipline that it takes to get yourself up early to go in there and like make it, you know, a, a dedicated time to get some work done when there's nobody else there. Like, those kinds of things really. And, and really just like the other thing is the, the willingness to, to fail, honestly, man, like, cause sales is really hard. It's kind of like, um, like in baseball, if you fail seven out of 10 times on average for your career, you're in the hall of fame, you know, like that's the, the it's, it's the same thing in sales. Like you, you're, you're going to miss more often than not. Like you just have to be okay with that. And like being able to eat the frog. Um, I think that's, that's a book that's out there. That's like, you know, get the, get the hardest thing done that you have to do for the day. Like get it done in the day, you know, get it done early in the day. The first thing that you do is just like, whatever, go bang out, a, go bang out 50 calls as soon as you get there. Um, and, and the other piece I'd say is like that I've heard a bunch of other people say, like, I'll echo this idea is like, stay balanced, um, find time to unplug and definitely get exercise. Like, like me, for me, uh, working exercise into my daily routine, like go to work and then exercise and then go to work and then exercise like that routine really keeps me balanced. Like, um, because when I'm exercising, I have to unplug from work, all that stuff goes away. And then, you know, you can sort of like get some rest, 
and then refocus for the next day. Like that cycle is like super important for me personally. Absolutely. Thank you so much for all that. That's really great information. And I couldn't agree with you more. Just trying to find that balance as far as work life and have that vessel to, to relieve that stress is definitely important. Yeah. And huge, hugely absolutely. important. Yeah. And then of course, as you mentioned, um, just really making the most out of your time and being as efficient as possible with your time is, is definitely key to success. So thank you for that. Um, and Patrick, I'm also just kind of curious, um, like obviously you've been in SDR, you know the job. Are there any things um, that you really um, like took a lot of value from when you were an SDR from your management team that you hope to kind of relay to, um, you know, your soon to be or soon to hire SDRs or something that really stuck out to you um, from a manager, maybe from a leader that, you know, you are really passionate about and you really want to make sure that um, the reps that work under you kind of get the same vibe, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, like one thing for sure is like just acknowledging that this is a hard job for like a lot of different reasons. Number one, it's a hard thing to do. Interrupt somebody's day and get them to agree to give you more time for something that they didn't know they wanted when they woke up today. That's hard to do. Um, it's also hard because like my personal experience, like going from being a high school teacher to walking in and like, you know, being on a team with like the youngest most inexperienced crew it's like the whole company like it kind of feels like everybody's kind of looking down on you like it's it just and it's and you fail a lot often so it's like it's easy to feel bad um like in i had a manager like um that was really really like aware of that uh and i think that that was super important um and and for sales leadership like like anytime we had senior leadership walk in to us and say you know hey we really appreciate what you guys are doing the work that you guys are doing is really important for the company and like we really really like our just awesome it's, it's awesome that you guys are here and we're super excited to have you like those kinds of things like made us feel so good um so i i, I would i would definitely like want to make sure that i pay that back Absolutely. Yeah. Just doing the little things. I feel like, yeah, like you mentioned, just really resonating that it is a hard job and that you appreciate those efforts. And I, I, yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. I, I felt the same way as an SDR. And then, and then like uh, one other, you know, vantage point that I've gotten to is like it, how important sales dev is to a company, like really makes a difference too. like, um, with full cast, like it's, it's a main priority for them. And I think for a lot of companies as well is like your top of funnel is, is actually very important. Like it's not an afterthought, like it, uh, and a lot of times, like when you're in an SDR role, it can feel like you're an afterthought. Um, so like if you're an SDR out there, like 100%, like you're an important person and you are very strong and you are very important. Like, like you are a strong player for the company. Um, and you can leverage that and you, and if you don't feel appreciated, like you should go somewhere where you are. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Patrick, really great stuff there. Um, and I do want to like shift gears a little bit more as we kind of head to our live cold email training, which I'm super excited about. Um, yeah. but did want to get your thoughts a bit. Um, obviously like I'm sure you get a bunch of sales calls today. I get a bunch of sales calls today. So, um, I'm kind of curious, like what your thoughts are as far as like using email as a channel to get people's attention, inform people on your product and service. And at the end, end of the day, like make those conversions. Um, like what are your thoughts on like using cold email as a channel to get new customers? Is it, is it the future? Is cold calling still like the most successful way of reaching someone and making those conversions? Would love to just hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, man, like everybody has an opinion on this and you read everything on LinkedIn and everybody can contradict each other. Like I just want, I should have even prefaced this before I started talking at all. Like I um, want to say that I am like not an expert, like, and like take everything I say and multiply it by zero. And I mean, <laughs> no, is, I like, wouldn't say that. Take it for what it is and observe it and like try to figure out like, why does he think that way? And why, like, what is, what is, you know, where is he coming from with that? Um, and then try to work that into like, you know, uh, how do you think about it? So like what I'm saying is when you're observing anybody else's advice, like try not to view it as a download of information, like, like observe, like, why are they trying to say that? Like what, what made them 
uh, think that way. Yeah. Right. So anyway, like that being said, um, my view about it is that it, it is inevitable. Like the phone is becoming less and less prevalent. Like I'm finding that the contacts that I'm going after, like the relevant decision makers in B2B sales are not available on the phone. Like you're not, they're not like sitting at a desk, like waiting for their phone to ring and answering it. Like that's something that was like in the eighties. Like that doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, you can get people on the phone, but like if it depends like what industry you're calling into, like when I was at zip whip, I was calling, um, you know, finance uh, people in the finance industry. So like banks and credit unions and stuff. And like those guys had phones. So like I could use the yeah. phone. I, I used the phone to, to great effect when I was at zip whip because like the people I was calling had phones here, like VP of sales at a software company, like doesn't probably doesn't even have an office. Like and probably doesn't even have a phone line associated associated with them. Like I found calling into a bunch of these businesses, the only phone lines that are active are for the sales team, the outbound sales team. So like you can call in and talk to the reps and like, they'll be nice to you and they'll probably give you some good advice, but you're, you're probably not going to be able to get a decision maker like on a cold call mm -hmm. uh, today. What you will be able to do is get their attention through an email and then be able to book time from them. So like the new call is like, basically like a discovery call, you know, like that's like the new version of a cold call is, is how I see it. Uh, depending on your industry. Yeah, definitely. And I think you kind of hit the nail on the hammer there as far as like, it really depends, right? Like who you're reaching out to the industry. Um, from my experience, like a lot of HR people, not by their desk too much. Um, you know, HVAC contractors always on the go. So I guess, like you mentioned, it just really um, takes like an understanding of like your ideal prospect and whether email would be um, a, a good way to get a hold of them. So, yeah. And that being said, like, I, I do think that, uh, the combo is essential. Like, you, you need to plan for a voicemail and an email and a LinkedIn touch. And I don't know, something else too. Like, like you, like you have to plan for being able to open every channel available. Um, mm -hmm. so that, because you don't know, you just, you don't know. Yeah. Um, I'm just kind of curious, Patrick, are there any emails or cold emails that you receive that caught your attention enough to, I don't know, elicit a laugh or a reply or some sort of conversion? And like, if so, like what kind of stood out um, to you in particular? Yeah. Um, you know, like with the, my new title and everything, like I've definitely gotten some, some stuff <laughs> in my inbox. Yeah. Um, and people reach out on LinkedIn because I'm very active on LinkedIn. So, uh, like maybe I'll give you some of the good and the bad. Uh, sure, that'd be awesome. Some of the good is like you know, uh, one of my posts I made uh, got a, a bunch of people commented on it, and then uh, there was a dude from a company that sells software that like mentioned the post in his email to me, like did a one shot cold email and the subject line was your post. And he was like, Hey man, I saw your post. Like you generated some really good discussion. Thought that was awesome. Like uh, this is what we do at my company. And basically like there wasn't much of a segue, but like he pointed out something good that I did. It something that turned out well and like just referenced that he was paying attention and it was kind of like the timing of it was there. Like the post was like active at the time. So like for me, it was like, all right, yeah, what's up, man? But like, let's, let's at least talk, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so I'll give you the time of day. Uh, it, that being said, like uh, I've had a couple that uh, were subpar where like I posted something on LinkedIn and then like, the rep like screenshotted it and sent it to me and then just pitched. And it's, it's like, there was no tying in. Like, yeah, I get that you saw that I have a job title that is relevant to you. Um, but you didn't look at my company at all. Like if you did, you would have noticed that like, this wasn't even a relevant message to us. Like, or like you, you, you know, like you, yeah. you got to do a little bit more than notice me on LinkedIn and see the job title and go, <sighs> Right. I mean, you gotta, you gotta like look at the company a little bit, like how big are they? Could they buy us? Like, is that, is that even something that's, that's reasonable, you know? Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Patrick. Uh, and I think this would be a perfect segue for you to kind of show us um, some of the templates that have 
work well for you or I guess um, some of the ways that you've seen success personally in terms of like cold messaging or cold email or cold copy? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I, I have a Google Doc here with a couple of things that I want to share. Um, and I will preface this again with saying that like, uh, it seems to be in sales that uh, plagiarism is rewarded, right? Like the more you can borrow from other people and, and use it, it's like, yeah, it's, it, it's all good. Um, so I want to give credit to those people. Uh, number one, Beck Holland from G2. She posts a lot of stuff on LinkedIn. Um, her flip the script series, like I, I caught it like sort of in the middle, um, but I've learned a lot from her. Like I got a lot of really positive feedback and negative feedback from her. Like she sort of like scored one of my emails with a lot of red ink uh, and gave me a lot of, of really good feedback that I, I'm totally willing to share because she puts all that stuff out there for, uh, for anybody that wants it as well. Um, and the other thing is Chris Voss. Um, Chris Voss is a former FBI hostage negotiator that uh, put out a book called Never Split the Difference. And, and it's really about like his application of FBI hostage negotiation tactics in the business world and in sales. Uh, and it's like it, by far the coolest thing I've ever read. Um, and he's got a bunch of like, um, like email things that you can sign up for to like, you, you know, he's got PDFs and like cool different things. So, so Chris Voss, um, I got a lot of ideas from and Beth Collin, I got a lot of ideas from. Uh, That's awesome. That, yeah. Yeah, and with that, I can uh, share my screen here. Definitely big players in the game. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so, um, yeah, it looks like I, I deleted all of the relevant personal info out of this. Uh, okay, you can see my screen right now, yeah? Yeah, we're good to go. Okay, so here's a couple, uh, a few different copies that have landed. Um, And this this first line, it seems like you're busy and I can understand that. Uh, there's a lot of different things that I've read that go against this and say like, don't waste any texts. Like don't write anything that's yeah. pointless. Don't write. And, and uh, the Chris Voss trick that I got is that when you enter into a sales conversation with anybody or, or really any type of conversation with another human being, um, you want to trigger empathy like you want the other person to know that like you're a person also and you're not trying to hurt them and that they can trust you. It's just like this thing that happens in everybody's brain. It's like, it's coded into your DNA. Um, so if I lead with empathy, if I say like, Hey man, you're busy. Uh, I, I get it. I, I tried to call you and it didn't, I couldn't get through, but this is the message that I wanted to give. Like that's like the way that I want to open up pretty much every cold communication. Um, and just for the simple fact that it sort of softens it uh, just as an interaction in general um, in my mind. And if, if you read never split the difference, like you'll, I wouldn't have to sell you on that. <laughs> um, so anyway, it seems like you're busy. I can understand that. I checked out your LinkedIn profile uh, before I tried calling and I'm impressed with your career in sales ops. Then this is going to be the relevant tie in. Like this particular person had a lot of like really technical background. Um, but also like a lot of really like business oriented type sales skills. Uh, so I just called that out. Like this is what it looks like on your LinkedIn profile. So I thought you'd be interested in our software because that's like the exact profile of somebody that would take a look at this page and get it. Um, and then I just reference what I said in the, what I said in the voicemail, just kind of like just repeat the voicemail back to them. Um, and in this, in this, uh, particular copy, I'm being like really open-ended and going like 180 degrees away from the typical sales mantras of like, you know, uh, funneling a person into like not having any choices. I'm giving them all the choice in the world. Like, look, I'm just checking in. I thought you might want to check this out. Uh, now might not be the right time, but if you were looking, I just wanted you to have me to reach out to. Um, and if this like goes against a lot of typical sales, yeah. uh, you know, mantras or whatever, but if you want to stand out from the noise, like I think that this personal approach, like this has gotten me more than one meeting, like this exact email. 
Um, and, uh, and again, like I've pulled it together from like various things that I've seen on the internet. Um, it's great stuff. Um, and curious, Patrick, like, um, you know, for, for something like this, that first email, which is really great, by the way, um, do you have any ideas on like maybe some subject lines for that email? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, I actually had listed out some subject lines here. Um, you know, I got these from various different uh, uh, articles that I've read, but the So You Like blank, like So You Like Sales Operations. Mm, I like that. So you like sales operations or so you like whatever they're the thing is that they're responsible for. Um, that one seems to get some pretty good open rates. Uh, and again, like it, you read stuff and it gets, it gets professed as though it's fact. And it's like, you just got to try stuff really just like get creative and try different things. Um, I've found that like posing a question in the subject line has been really good. Um, asking somebody if they want to connect or reconnect, like if it's a, a prospect that you had talked to six months ago, um, that said, call me in a few months, like the reconnect as a subject line, like no matter what the content is, like seems to get people to open. Um, and the word credibility, I use this like at the end of a sequence a lot. Um, so like if I have, you know, six emails that went out, like the last email will be credibility because like, to me, if you've gotten six emails and you've been opening them uh, and you're not taking the meeting, like you don't think that I'm credible for some reason. So I want to establish credibility in that last email. Um, so that's, that's, those are some of my thoughts on subject lines. It's great stuff. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and so I think that, so you like sales operations was the subject line for this one uh, for all three of these actually. Yeah. Very cool. Um, that Beck Collin one looks pretty interesting. You mind uh, touching that one a bit? What this this one here, the Beck Holland, yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, Beck Holland again has the flip the script series. Uh, she actually put up all the info available on bravado.co, um, which I can link to uh, in the post about about this podcast. Um, but I had submitted one of my emails, and she sort of like shredded it a little bit, and like gave me. Um, some really good feedback. And then like, this is kind of like the Beck Holland version of like something else that I had done. Um, so I, I can kind of like talk through a little bit of like what she, she was coming at with this. Um, you know, the, the tie in, like when you check out somebody's LinkedIn profile, like her point was like the tie in has to be like very specific. So like I made this up, this is about a, a completely fictitious candidate, like a, a totally fictitious prospect. Um, but everything up until here can be scripted, right? Like I saw your LinkedIn profile before I tried calling and I couldn't stop reading. What really caught my eye was when you said blank. And then what you paste in here is like the thing that makes them a valid prospect for you. Like, why are you picking this person to reach out to? Um, and like, if somebody's profile said that go to market planning is the key to success, like you bet your bottom dollar that I'm going to be emailing them. <laughs> Right. Like that's, that's exactly the person that I'm looking for. Um, so I thought you want to check out full cast. Uh, and then this is like, instead of feature dumping, like you, you pitch like what would happen as a result of them buying your product. Right. So like imagine one collaborative planning environment instead of all these different Excel spreadsheets. Um, what if you could execute a plan adjustment or do a what if scenario and see what would happen if you did? If you're curious, and I think that this is a really important point that she that she made is um, give one time slot like it, instead of saying, like, I have time this week or let me know when's a good time for you. Yeah. It's like it's like give them an appointment and like then it's very specific to that person, right? Like Wednesday at two o'clock, 15 minutes, like we can figure this out and then we can move on from there if not. Um, and again, it takes a little bit more attention from the rep. Like you can't send everybody an invite that says Wednesday at two o'clock. It's yeah. another thing that like that proves you're a human <laughs> because you have to think about that. That's like true. you, you, I mean, there's only so many Wednesday at two appointments that you can send out. Like, what if more than one person says yes? So, like, these are like sniper type emails that like don't go out to everybody. Um, I, I guess, like, sort of off topic, but not really, is like another way 
I could see you implementing this is like, let's say you have a cadence that your manager set up for you. Like you're in a sequence, like your manager set up the sequence, like you don't get to change it. You have to send out the emails the way that it goes out. Um, then you could, if, if you're getting a lot of engagement, you're getting the person to open the emails that, that your manager set up for you or that whoever set up for you, you can pull one of those people out of cadence and send them an email like this. Like I used to get appointments like that at Zipwhip all the time where I would see the person engaging with my, with my emails, um, but they weren't biting on the meeting. And then I would send them a message like this, like, Hey, I, I saw your profile, blah, blah, blah. I'm a human, like call me for the meeting. And then they would. Um, so I, I've had that work for me too. Interesting. That's super interesting. I like, I love that call to action. And I love how you, again, how you mentioned like that one time specific to you, you, you can't mass produce that or else you'll definitely be screwed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that's genius. Like that was one of the things I pulled from Beck Holland that was like, wow, that's like, that was a game changer for me. It was like, I've been doing this wrong for the whole time. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it. Um, yeah. I see the, the reference one that, that seems pretty interesting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just really quick. Like this is basically the same setup as some, as the top one where it's sort of open-ended and just kind of like loosely letting them know what I do um, and, and letting them know that I'm there if they want to reach out. But like a very, very powerful thing in sales is like actually knowing somebody. <laughs> so like leverage your connections and it's very easy to do so. Like, Hey, I see that this person works at your company and I used to work with them that alone got me the meeting. Like I didn't have to say anything else, <laughs> you know, like I know this dude that you work with, like I worked with him. He can vouch for me. Like I'm, I'm a human. I'm, I'm a nice yeah. guy. Um, and then, you know, he gave me the call back and said like, what's up? Like, let's talk. So, um, those, those would be my, like, I guess like three emails that I've scored with. That's some really great stuff there. Um, and, and I love, um, I love the reference one. I mean, just, just leveraging your own network and the people that you know to, without really having to, to pry, pry much information or really plead your case. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And if you can get any Intel about like what, uh, what the person's working with or it, I mean, it depends what kind of product or yeah. service that you're selling, but obviously like any type of information that you can leverage, um, it's going to be even better. So just a couple quick points, like, um, you know, the subject lines I kind of already talked about, but, uh, Chris Voss, like the, the establishing empathy thing, it, it comes up like not only in a cold email, but pretty much like any time that you're dealing with a prospect. Um, and like you, you just want to make sure that they know that you understand like what their plight is. So you always want to like try to summarize or like restate things that you notice that they're doing or saying, like, even if it seems really obvious, like, um, if somebody, you know, if you're talking to them and they seem pretty tight, like, it seems like there might be some challenges here. Like what, or is there anything that that's bothering you about this or is there anything that you see as being a difficulty, you know, or, you know, uh, it, it looks like you guys are really doing a great job in sales. Uh, you know, I noticed that you're hiring 20 sales reps this year you know, that kind of stuff. Or like if you're in a, a conversation, like just using these labels, mm. um, like really, and like, uh, uh, you know, sort of like, uh, uh, embedding that into your lexicon is really just going to help you become more observational and like become more consultative. Um, they're less salesy word. They kind of soften the punch a bit. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much it. That's all I got, man. That's some really great stuff, Patrick. Um, thank you so much for drafting this up and obviously um, pulled some key information from some other sales leaders. Uh, be really cool if we could uh, maybe share that with uh, the audience here, um, if that's okay with you. But um, yeah, Patrick, before we kind of wrap here, um, you know, I just wanted to get your thoughts. Um, you know, if there's any advice that you could have given yourself before you started the sales development role or, you know, for anyone that's listening out there, that's potentially considering a career in sales or an entry level sales role. Um, what advice do you have for them? Yeah. Um, just that if you're going to take like a sales development job, or if you want to try to get in or like work your way up that way, like the stuff that you're going through today doesn't last forever. Like it just, it does not like one year is not a long time. Um, and, 
like the more the actions that you take today, like for the most part, you're not going to see any results for three months. So like expect at least six months before you start feeling good about what's happening. Um, and at that point, like you're almost there. Uh, and, and you can, you can figure out like, where do I want to go with this? What do I want to do with this? And, and you're going to learn a lot. Um, and there's always something exciting around the corner, like no matter where you are, no matter who you work for. So like, just, just be happy to be alive. Like no matter how bad it gets. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, absolutely. Those are some really inspiring words, Patrick. Thank you so much for uh, providing all this great info and providing these really great email tips. I know the SDR community will definitely be really appreciative of that. Um, if anyone out there that's listening um, would like to, you know, reach you directly or interested in learning a little bit more about career opportunities at Fullcast, you know, where can they find you? Yeah. Oh, LinkedIn is a great um, platform for that. I, I respond to messages like pretty regularly. Um, and if not, you know, Patrick at fullcast.io, uh, just send me a message. Like, let me know if you want to connect, if you want to uh, chit chat or just, uh, you know, if, if you've got anything going on, let me know. Sweet. Patrick, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Um, to everyone listening out there, thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of the Sales Dev Squad podcast. Feel free to like, comment, share, subscribe. We have a Facebook page, LinkedIn page. Um, thank you guys for your time today and we'll catch you on the next one.